Hey everyone, and welcome to the first lecture video for Unit 9, the last unit in Apes. Wow, we made it! Look around you. Don't you feel good? Uh, this unit is all about global change, stuff that we've been talking about and hinting at all year long. Uh, we're now going to dig into things like uh, ozone depletion, climate change, ocean warming and acidification, invasive species, and endangered species. And through those topics, we will discuss how local activities, things we do every day, can have global impacts, how we're going to face what the, the challenges we face as a planet and how we're going to face them, how we're going to solve these problems, ultimately determining whether or not Earth is just a giant example of the tragedy of the commons. So let's dig into Unit 9, and uh, we'll do so by starting looking at the ozone layer, ozone, ozone depletion, the hole in the ozone layer. These are all terms that you might have heard about or around surrounding this topic. So uh, let's break it down. Uh, well, hopefully we don't want to break the ozone layer down. That's, <laughs> that's part of the problem. So uh, earlier this year, we talked about the layers of the atmosphere, in unit form, we talked about the troposphere where we live and the stratosphere, and in one of the, uh, as well as the, the mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, one of the characteristics of the stratosphere is that it's got this layer of ozone uh, within it. That's where most of the ozone forms. And then in unit seven, we talked about air pollution. We talked about how tropospheric ozone is a form of air pollution. It's dangerous to breathe and it's a part of smog formation. Um, we're going to be focusing on the ozone that's in the stratosphere. This is the ozone layer covering the whole Earth uh, in the stratosphere, and it is crucial for the survival of life on Earth, life on Earth because that ozone layer blocks ultraviolet right, light. Excuse me, blocks ultraviolet light from uh, reaching the Earth's surface. Doesn't block all of it, but it blocks a lot of it, and that has massive impacts on life on the planet. Um, not only is that going to uh, block uh, the, the UV rays can lead to increased rates of skin cancer in humans and animals, as well as uh, cataracts, which is um, an issue with your eyes. Where it becomes harder to see, um, damages your vision. Um, and so, if we see a reduction in the ozone layer, a depletion in the ozone layer, which is what is happening to the globe right now, more UV rays are going to get in. So we'll see higher rates of skin cancer, higher rates of cataracts. We'll also see uh, photosynthesis is negatively impacted in plants, both on land and in sea. So we'll see a reduction in primary productivity, which could lead to lower crop yields and disruption of food chains. So um, the the like I said, it's crucial for the survival of life on Earth that the ozone layer is maintained. Now, one of the things, or one of the problems with, with the ozone layer uh, is that it is, it is disappearing. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the way that humans are behaving um, is actually causing that ozone layer to degrade. Uh, and you might be able to figure out what the problem is from this picture. You weren't alive, certainly, during the hair metal bands of the 80s, um, but uh, the music is fantastic, so you should definitely check it out. Um, it has to do with hairspray. Um, and uh, although this, this seems kind of funny, thinking that these rock bands are causing the hole in the ozone layer, the excessive use of aerosols is actually a major contributor to the degradation of ozones, uh, of the ozone layer. The ozone layer is broken down and degraded by these, these molecules called chlorofluorocarbons, uh, CFCs. Right, chlorofluorocarbons. They're used in aerosol sprays, like spray paint and hairspray. They're used as coolants. Uh, to keep things cold, both in your refrigerator, your freezers, uh, and your air conditioners. Uh, and there's also sort of a um, market name for some of those chemicals, Freon, which is released by DuPont. Uh, and what happens, uh, the, these CFCs have high resonance times, meaning that they, once they're in the atmosphere, they stay there for a long time. They don't break down um, right away. They stick around for a while. And they will react with ozone and break it down and turn it into oxygen. Okay, um, so thus depleting the amount of ozone. This happens in the stratosphere, right? Um, and let me walk you through this reaction. Uh, you do need to be familiar with this reaction, so I'll walk you through it a few times. So this is a chlorofluorocarbon. Um, it's the orange molecule, the orange circles here are chlorine atoms. The uh, black circles are oxygen atoms, and the white circle is a fluorine atom. Uh, so we've got this chlorofluorocarbon here, the CFC, and when it's exposed to UV light, uh, a chlorine will uh, detach through a chemical reaction, it will, it will be removed, and that chlorine atom will then react with ozone. Here's three oxygen atoms bonded together, uh, that's an ozone molecule. And this chlorine atom uh, is what we call uh, 
an oxidizer. It's really, really hungry uh, for, for protons. Um, it's got a strong, strong charge, uh, strong negative charge. So it can rip an oxygen molecule or uh, an atom off this uh, ozone molecule. So it's basically turning O3 into O2, right? So we've got a chlorine that then bonds with an oxygen, uh, and then it leaves behind these two oxygen molecules. Uh, and then another loose oxygen will come around and react with the oxygen that's bonded to the chlorine. So it will basically turn two, uh, or it'll turn one ozone molecule uh, into two oxygen molecules. Or, well, if we balance the equation, it will turn two ozone molecules into six oxygen atoms, but you, or oxygen molecules. You don't have to worry about that so much. Um, here's a, maybe a little bit better of a demonstration of, of how this reaction works. We've got a chlorofluorocarbon here. Um, three chlorine atoms in red here. It reacts with the sun and a chlorine atom gets ripped off. That chlorine atom is then very reactive and reacts with the ozone, uh, ripping an oxygen off that ozone molecule, which you can see here in green. It's bonded with the chlorine in red. and leaves behind an oxygen. Uh, this one singular oxygen atom will then react with another molecule like this one that's floating around in the air. So uh, one chlorine atom uh, will break apart one ozone molecule. Uh, into oxygen and then this chlorine monoxide, which will then react with another chlorine monoxide, monoxide to form another oxygen molecule, right? So this is how ozone is broken down, through CFCs. And again, these CFCs are coming from uh, chemicals that humans are using. Um, and the breakdown, as, as this continues, the ozone layer will start to break down and uh, eventually leads to the development of what we are now calling a, a hole in the ozone layer. Sometimes it's referred to as thinning in the ozone layer. Um, and at this hole, which is usually located around the Antarctic, more UV light is reaching the Earth's surface. And it, again, it leads to higher rates of skin cancer, cataracts, lower primary productivity, etc. Uh, and the hole is worse during Antarctic spring uh, because it's in the southern hemisphere. That's during October. Remember, their seasons are reversed to the northern hemisphere. Uh, and if you look at these dates, they're all in October um, because that's when the hole in the ozone layer is worse. So why is it why is it so bad in Antarctica? Well, there are special clouds. It gets up to negative 80 degrees in Antarctica during the winter. That's really cold. Celsius, by the way, Celsius. Uh, so that's super duper cold. Uh, special clouds will form under this extreme cold during the Antarctic winter and form ice crystals. And these ice crystals are the perfect surface for chlorine to react on and to break off of the CFCs and then start breaking down ozone. These special clouds, you don't need to know the name, but if you're curious, they can be called polar stratospheric clouds. Sometimes they're called nacreous clouds or mother of pearl clouds. It's hard to find a picture. I think this is a picture of them. Um, and the strong polar winds from the Coriolis effect will trap a lot of these clouds around the Antarctic area. Um, and this is all happening in the wintertime. These clouds are forming and helping chlorine to break off of CFCs. Uh, and then in the springtime, uh, what happens in the spring is because Antarctica is at the pole, uh, the difference in sunlight between the winter and the summer is dramatic, right? There is a lot more sunlight in the spring of the Antarctic compared to the winter. So as spring approaches, we see a big, big increase in UV light. UV light is energy, and that will catalyze the chemical reactions that lead to ozone degradation. And as the, this area starts to warm, these ice crystals will start to melt that we're trapping the chlorine, and it will release any trapped chlorine that it has, which will also exacerbate these reactions. So that's why we start to see the holes, hole in the ozone layer at, at its worst in um, their spring, which is around October of each year. Uh, here's a diagram showing the same thing again um, with the sunlight coming in. Um, and in the springtime in the Antarctic, we see increased levels of UV light. So the initiation of this reaction starts to happen more frequently and faster with the chlorine breaking off, reacting with the ozone, creating oxygen atom and a chlorine monoxide, which reacts with another chlorine monoxide to form more oxygen. Right? Um, should be familiar with that equation relatively. Um, so, Dora, it's so good to see you again, and I'm so sorry to see you so upset. Um, obviously, this is pretty, uh, pretty worrying, and you might be wondering, what are we supposed to do about this? Well, folks, when the globe faces a challenge like no other, there's only one thing you can do. There's only one person you can call, and that is... Oh, Canada, bring up all the Canadians. 
Get all the Canadians in here. We need every single Canadian. When the world's in trouble, you go to Canada. Everybody knows that. Um, <laughs> I'm joking uh, in some ways, but in many ways, I'm not, because the legislation that is helping to address the hole in the ozone layer was called the Montreal Protocol. It was signed in Montreal. Uh, hopefully this helps you remember the name of it. Uh, Montreal's in Canada, in case you didn't know that. It was signed in 1987. It's an international treaty to phase out CFCs, these chlorofluorocarbons. Um, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, but some people are replacing them with other chemicals that, uh, like HFCs that don't do as much damage to the ozone layer. Uh, it is the most successful international treaty ever. Uh, it has been super effective. The ozone hole uh, is smallest since its first discovery in 1982, um, and it is getting smaller every day. So if you take a look at this graph, on the x-axis we've got years, uh, and on the y-axis we've got the effects, effective chlorine concentration in parts per billion, and, and we've got them from a variety of different chemicals. Uh, CFCs are in light blue here. And if you look, you see that over time with the initiation of the Montreal Protocol in 87, uh, right around here, we start to see a dip. Um, and th that will continue to dip. Uh, thankfully, if we compare it to no protocol, the models of what we would have if there was no protocol, uh, we'd probably all be burning up right now because of the lack of ozone. So thankfully, the Montreal Protocol is working. You'll notice though there is a lag, um, and some chemicals that were produced 10 years ago might still be in the atmosphere. So um, the ozone layer might be getting uh, might get a little bit worse before it gets better. But we're uh, we've done what we can, and we're, we're on that right trajectory. Um, and if you look at the sources of stratospheric chlorine, uh, the Montreal Protocol handles CFCs, which makes up over 50% of the uh, sources of stratospheric chlorine, which is what causes the breakdown of ozone. So that's great. Montreal Protocol is a win. It's a W. Uh, again, if you look at this graph here, it's a different graph. Uh, we've got year on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, uh, in red, this red line here, we've got the amount of ozone. And in uh, green here on the other y-axis, these green dots here represent the amount of stratospheric chlorine. Uh, and it might seem like, if you look at this graph, oh, well, as chlorine goes down, the amount of ozone goes down. So chlorine is actually good for ozone. But again, it, there's a lag here, right? Because if you take a look, uh, as the, um, the, the ozone here is dipping because of the long-term impacts that chlorine is having in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere. But once chlorine is low, and it's lowered uh, as we get to the late 2000s, um, you'll actually start to see the ozone concentration increasing again um, because there's a lag. So the protocol was enacted in 87 here, right? Um, and we don't start to see the impacts of that protocol until decades later, right? So there is a lag for global change. Um, that's one of the the issues with tackling it is that you can't be solved right now. Um, you know, the, the things that we're doing right now are going to have impacts 5, 10, 20 years from now. Um, so we need, to, we need to think of solutions that are long term. Um, and like I said, it's the ozone layer is recovering. The Montreal Protocol has been super duper successful and has actually served as a, as a sort of a role model for other protocols like the Paris Climate Accords or the Kyoto Protocol which we'll talk about a little bit later this week in terms of how to do successive, success, successful international policy. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about is that um, many companies are replacing chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs, with HCFCs, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, or uh, HFCs, hydrofluorocarbons. Um, and these chemicals, HCFCs and HFCs, uh, they do not degrade ozone. They're what we say they have a, they have a lower ozone depleting potential. Um, and so as a result, once the Montreal Protocol was initiated, you can see the amount of HFCs that are being used uh, has increased substantially uh, since 1990, going from nearly nothing to, um, you know, it looks like maybe a thousand million tons uh, consumed. And uh, in 2010, a lot of it used for refrigerating and air conditioning. Um, and the only problem is HCFCs and hydrofluorocarbons are what we refer to as super greenhouse gases. So CO2 can warm the atmosphere by, let's say, one degree. I'm just making that up off the top of my head. Uh, 
uh, trifluoromethane, which is a hydrofluorocarbon pictured here, uh, is about 11,700 times worse than CO2 in terms of global warming. It is way, way, way more impactful at trapping heat and it has a much longer resonance time. So there's a big, big issue here where it's like, yes, these replace CFCs and help protect the stratosphere and the ozone layer, uh, but they're also much, much worse greenhouse gases than CO2. So we need to curb the use of HCFCs and HFCs as well. Um, and a lot of uh, stuff has actually been done to do that. Uh, in December of 2020, the COVID relief bill that was passed in the United States is requiring chemical manufacturers to decrease, decrease the amount of H HFC production so we won't see this crazy greenhouse gas uh, as much. And there's a lot of new technology being developed to replace HFCs and HCFCs with um, chemicals that will not harm the climate or the ozone layer, uh, like ammonia or um, or even CO2 would be an improvement because although it's a greenhouse gas, it's much, much uh, less potent than HFCs. Uh, okay, last thing, and this is probably the most important thing that you learn from this video. The ozone hole, the hole in the ozone layer, everything I just talked about, it has pretty much, for the most part, absolutely nothing to do with climate change. A lot of people lump these two things together. It's one of the biggest misconceptions that we see on the AP exam. The ozone hole is not climate change. Climate change is not the hole in the ozone layer, right? They might impact one another and they might interact in different ways, but they are completely separate global issues, okay? Um, do not mix them up. <laughs> all right, and that's all I've got for you. Bring your questions to class and I will see you later.